Our reading from the New Testament this morning comes from James, third chapter, verses 13 through chapter 4, 3, 7, 8. Who is wise and knowledgeable among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be arrogant and lie about the truth. This is not wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly, in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. The word of God for the people of God. Just a little bit more on the back. Oh, oh there it is. <laughs> Let me continue now with part two. <laughs> Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, your sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, this is the full word of God for now for the people of God. And to you as well. So, <laughs> so um, a couple people mentioned the uh, cover art here on the uh, on the bulletin, very stark imagery there. So what you see there before you is uh, called Bending the Knee, and actually if you're a fan of Game of Thrones, there was like a whole meme that erupted out of uh, those words, but uh, the other word for that would be genuflecting. And the act of genuflecting, or bending the knee, uh, has been part of human culture for time immemorial. Now we all know what it is to kneel, but Kneeling in our culture isn't really something we do with regularity. When you're young, um, and I would dare say maybe when you're older too, but especially when you're young, this idea of kneeling, it kind of rubs you the wrong way. It's synonymous with submission, and the idea of submission really isn't something we're comfortable with in our culture. There's, it's like it's almost there's something baked into our culture that hates the very idea of submission. To submit implies that you've recognized that someone or some power is higher than you. And in times past, uh, we might refer to people like that as our superiors, um, which implies that Submission forces us to accept the idea that we are inferiors to them. And I don't think there's a person in this room here this morning comfortable with that idea, right? I mean, I don't like the idea either. Genuflection is something we reserve these days for special occasions. For example, last month, we knelt there at those very communion rails. We observed Holy Communion in a way that Epworth once did years ago. For those of you that participated that day, if you can remember, how did that feel to you? Did it feel good to do it again that way? You liked it? Yeah. Good. We, um, we might genuflect when we pray, especially in that form of Holy Communion, that's why those rails exist, but um, there are other forms of kneeling, for example, when we watch a sporting event, like football, for example, but it's not exclusive to football. Players will often genuflect when someone gets hurt on the field. You've seen it. Uh, 
There's Tim Tebow, who became known for Tebowing, or kneeling on the field as a sort of post-touchdown celebration. Um, when we propose marriage, we take a knee, you know. Uh, has anyone here ever been presented with a folded flag? Yeah, a couple of you, yeah. So the presenting officer will go down to their left knee to present the flag if the recipient is seated. That's the protocol. All right. Um, so bending the knee, in my opinion, should not be thought of as an act of inferiority. That's really what I'm getting at here. It's really about respect, you know? To declare respect for someone else is not something that lowers us. And we shouldn't think of it that way. I'll be very frank with you. It demonstrates, I'd say, that we've been raised right and that we value someone's contributions to our lives. Now, we live these days with a common refrain that respect is earned. But, you know, I don't think that should be the case. Honoring people who others honor is not a weakness. It does not demonstrate weakness. It demonstrates strength of character, which is itself admirable. Yeah, of course, there are occasions where respect can be misplaced, but showing respect is always a personal decision, and it is one that we are in control of. That's not weakness. I would even venture to say that making that decision says more about us than it does the person being honored. Many authors in scripture talk about the difference between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. It's a common refrain in scripture. Now for those unacquainted with God or unacquainted with scripture, I would say that worldly wisdom is kind of all that they know. They don't know that there's a difference there. The idea of a superior force active in the world beyond our understanding is going to be a tough pill for them to swallow, I think. Heck, it's tough for anyone, really, because it implies that we are somehow inferior or subordinate to it. And I think this may be the reason why the acceptance of certain truths are crucial to the idea of faith. In order for faith to just get off that runway, we have to declare our worldly limitations. We have to say, you know, I don't think I have everything figured out. And making that decision will immediately put you in conflict with everyone unwilling to accept the idea that something else might in fact be superior to them. Humility. Humility is the beginning of faith, according to these biblical authors, especially the one that wrote this morning's passage from Scripture. And humility is in short supply, I would say, for most people. I would not call myself a humble person. I think I've done it pretty well so far, but even 20 years ago, I was a very different man, a man I'm not proud of. And frankly, I think it's because society teaches us that humility isn't really worth it. Humility doesn't pay the bills. It certainly doesn't get us any raises. And that is precisely why James is pushing us to comprehend the difference between God's wisdom and our own. Worldly wisdom, according to James, will never lead us to prosperity, maybe for a short while. But what it does is it puts us on a never-ending, generational cycle of problems that are born out of our selfish desires. It puts us on a hamster wheel of conflict. Like I mentioned to the children, there are some people who are always going to feel like winners and losers. Inevitably, our desires are going to clash with someone else's. And that leads us down a darker road because it's as if we don't know a better way to get ahead without making someone into a loser. 
And that dark road is full of victors and far more losers. Because the further down the path, you will note there is a greater number of losers because the winners have become very good at winning and have gobbled up all the resources. They have systems that they've put in place to ensure that losers stay losers. But a perspective of the world rooted in godly wisdom sits apart from this system. It cares nothing for getting ahead, only making sure that everyone has enough. It doesn't waste energy on conflict, but reserves it for acts of creation. These good fruits that the passage spoke of, born out of peace. And every bit of that alternate system is powered not by the individual, but by God, almost completely independent of personal will, that our weaknesses would not be the cause of failure, but in fact the very beacon that God is drawn toward. Now James advises his disciples, submit to God. Submit. Submit. Adopt a mindset of resistance toward any thought of creating self-advantage. That's hard. That's real hard. In fact, because there were some verses omitted from this morning's reading, some very harsh ones, James says, forget happiness. Let it go. Don't try to bring it about. Stop doing that. Stop striving. On the contrary, lament the state of things around you. Lament the state of things within you. Purify yourself. Make yourself pure. Purity and humility function in concert with one another. Both create a striving for the truth. And the truth is purity itself. To seek purity is to imply that we need to be free of some kind of contamination. Perhaps a stronger word would, word would be adulteration. That we are not, in fact, pure. We might call it a refiner's fire, this process. That this road that God leads us down. What God seeks from us is purity a refining process that brings out the us that God has always known is there because God made us, you see. Free from the shackles and cares of the world that weigh us down and try to convince us that if we just had this, if things were this way, if this person was not the way they were, or did not stand in the way of our success, that we would be happy. James says, no, stop that. Give that up. Stop thinking that way. Let yourself be humbled so that like Mary, mother of Jesus, we might witness the way that God humbles the proud and lifts the lowly. And that's a scary place to be, siblings in Christ, because it is a vulnerable place to be. We are so used to bringing things about, working hard to bring about our happiness and our joy. I dare say we wouldn't know what to do with ourselves if we didn't have to earn a living, strive for those we care about, to just let things be. That's not the way we live. And we know everyone else is doing it too, by the way. And we don't want to miss out on opportunities or have them taken from us by people more powerful than us. I think to change, there needs to be some form of transformation. And it can't come from us, but it certainly would involve us. A transformation of the spirit. I'd like to share with you um, an experience that my wife and I had. 
uh, two years ago, we had the opportunity to go on pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And as it turns out, the two weeks that my wife and I spent there, they happened right at the beginning of this latest wave of tension between Palestinians and Israelis, culminating in the war that we're witnessing now. One of the most valuable lessons I learned while I was on pilgrimage was the importance of adoration. So adorate, let me ask a question. Any recovering Catholics in here? You don't have to identify yourself. Uh, adoration is something that Roman Catholics understand very well. They observe it quite often, actually, especially when it comes to Holy Communion, um, Mary, and the saints. For Protestants like ourselves, adoration isn't really something we do. It's not something we were taught the importance of. I think the one exception might be in Holy Communion. So, for example, we don't kneel before the cross. I mean, I can't think of the last time we did that, except, again, at Holy Communion. Um, there's a figure of Jesus, you know, right there. We're not kneeling at the feet of the figure kissing its feet or, or, or using it as the subject of prayer when we're in the sanctuary. But in the Holy Land, I witnessed an entire system of adoration that left me breathless so many times. I walked the Via Dolorosa. This is the prescribed path that Jesus walked carrying his cross in the old city. And you stop at these 14 different stations to observe a different part of that story. You recall his suffering and express gratitude for his sacrifice. I entered countless chapels, some very large and some no bigger than a closet, devoted to the adoration of different figures found in the Gospels, or recalling some part of Jesus' earthly ministry and giving thanks. I knelt down in the Aedicule in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the, the holiest site we have in Christianity, right there at the alleged site where it was said that Jesus was laid to rest after dying on the cross. And all of these experiences gave me an appreciation for the need we have of adoration in our religious life. And I experienced a deep sense of lament for how we overlook it in church these days. We Methodists don't really have a strong idea about adoration. It's almost as if a whole side of our faith was barely explored. But once you begin to practice it, after being exposed to it, it becomes essential. But none of those experiences I mentioned compared to what I saw at the Basilica of the Annunciation in Nazareth. Let me tell you folks, Nazareth is a happening town, especially at night. It lights up, it's beautiful. My wife and I happened across the Basilica one night not knowing what it was. We were just very impressed at the architecture of this building before us and the event that we were witnessing. We were walking the streets, uh, heading back to the compound of the Sisters of Nazareth where we were staying uh, as part of an overnight in our pilgrimage experience. And as we were walking with our group of friends, we heard some very beautiful music coming from this courtyard there. We saw um, through a gate a large procession of pilgrims. Uh, they had candles with some little blue shields on them in a, you know, standing in the courtyard. It was like they were waiting for something and some of them were singing. And then we started hearing some foreign language. And we decided to just check it out, you know? Like, my first thought was, oh, maybe somebody's getting married or something like that. Um, and we went with our group of friends to see what was going on, and later we discovered that this was in fact a worship service held every Saturday called the Fiacolata. So it includes music, a procession, a prayer of the rosary in many languages, and the contemplation of the joyful mysteries. So if you've been Methodist your whole life, you don't even know what that is, of which there are five, by the way. The Annunciation of Jesus' birth, the Visitation of Mary with Elizabeth, who bore John the Baptist, the birth of the Lord, 
the presentation of Jesus in the temple eight days after his birth, and finally the finding of Jesus at the temple by his parents when he was 12. These events are commemorated in this service. Believe me when I tell you that this experience was one of the most blessed of my whole life. I was raised by a father who was, I mean, he had a bitter hatred of Catholicism. He was very critical, and I frankly never understood why. I was taught that the veneration of Mary was idolatry. What I learned in the Holy Land is that adoration is at the very heart of these practices, not idol worship, adoration. My group joined what must have been at least 200 pilgrims in a ritual that centered on the joy that comes from a deep humility before God, adoration. I'd like to conclude this sermon by asking us to participate in something very familiar to us in Methodism. In the bulletin, it's usually listed as a prayer of confession. It's about the closest we come to confession, really, and it's a typical act of worship. Uh, we accompany it afterward with a statement of pardon from the pastor. Sometimes it's associated with communion Sundays. Some do it every week. Now, the prayer that I'd like us to pray together um, that we'll use for this was written by a woman named Carolyn Brown. She authors the website Worshiping with Children, and this is a resource that I've been using since the beginning of my ministry when I write children's messages. So what I'll have you do is you'll repeat after me, and then I'll conclude the prayer with the pardon. And I hope that as we pray, you might experience that sense of adoration. Because adoration is not weakness. It is literally an alternate perspective of the world. Let's enter an attitude of prayer. Please repeat after me. God, we want to look amazing. We want great clothes. Cool shoes, a great haircut. We want our rooms in our homes filled with our stuff. We want all the best people to be our friends. We want to be the first, the best the most, the greatest. So we grab and hold and demand. We even kick and punch to get what we want. Forgive us. Teach us to let go, to open our hands, and hearts to others. Teach us to be content with what we have and to share it. Teach us to think as much about what they want as what we want. Teach us to be as loving as Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Siblings in Christ, take heart. Before we ever thought to ask God for forgiveness, it was granted to us by God's grace. Jesus has taken away the sins of the world. Would you repeat after me one final time? In the name of Jesus, you are forgiven. Thank you very much, Church, for forgiving me. Glory be to God, and amen. Thank you. And now let's go ahead and join together in our hymn of response. You'll find it in The Faith We Sing, the slim black book there. 
number 2223. They'll know we are Christians by our love. Feel free to stand or sit as you'd like. 